Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Second Breakfast podcast. I'm Andy Roth alongside Phil Duvall. Say hi, Phil. Oh, hi, everybody. I didn't see you there. It's so good to have you with us today. It is so I to- good. I it's, totally mean that. I'm yeah. not just sounding... And I'm not just saying that. What a day it's been already. Yes, yes. And we have a great show today. Very oh, excited. Oh, boy. You know, so it's funny excited. that you think that we might just be saying that. But people, this show is special. I always think it's funny when you watch those uh, those talk show hosts. And they're like, we got a great show store for you tonight. I'm like, what do you... What? Like, normally you have a crappy show? Today is... <laughs> right. Today is right. special? But today um, is actually... It's, it should be a good day. We have a special guest. We do. We um, He'll be joining us in a bit. Spoiler alert, and just to ruin the magic a little bit, we've actually already done the interview with him, and so this is, uh, it's, uh, Andy grimaced just then when I said it. But I don't, I don't look, know what you're talking about. I don't. Okay, good. We've already done the interview with him, and I, I'm excited to present it to you people. It's not, it's not true. We haven't already done the interview. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. We haven't already done the interview. No, it hasn't happened yet. But I feel like it's going to be great. I just, I just have this sense. It's going to sense. be excellent. Yes, yes. So, I, I, I. I I'm sorry. No one wants to see how the sausage is made. It's, I apologize. It's, it, <laughs> I, I can, it, it, like, like, I can, I can, I can touch the interview. It's like a sixth sense. It's no, a sixth. No, that would actually be one of the five. Okay. No, um, the five. Touching is a is a sense. That <laughs> we're we're already we're we're good there. We you touch is covered. Uh, but first, uh, and and of course, we we will end today as it is Friday, sending you off blissfully into the weekend with a couple of questions. From pulled directly from our viewer mailbag, which means people like you, and you, I'm, I'm you. talking directly to you, the viewer uh, listener, indeed, uh, have uh, you have sent it in? It's, where where do they send in their questions, Phil? Second breakfast. Shoot, I already messed it up. Second breakfast podcast at gmail dot com. No, it's it's totally cool. It's not like it's the name of our endeavor or anything. So second breakfast podcast at gmail.com. No dots, no spaces, no underscores, no capitalizations. The word second is it doesn't? No. <laughs> I worked so hard at that. <laughs> it Just was very good. It was very it's, it's very good. It was very good up to that point. You're 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 on a roll. Keep going. Keep going. I am I am I want to tell you that something terrifying just happened while I'm talking to you. Are you ready for this? Probably not. Okay. Three Mormons just rode by on their bikes. Why is that scary? I have no idea. Three? It's always two. What is the third Mormon doing? I don't think so. All I've I'm seen sa- three in a group. No, no, no. It's two. They go two by two. That's part of the deal. It's like part of the deal. Okay, okay but, but right. But maybe I've seen them when they weren't doing their deal. Maybe they're not doing their deal. I don't trust it. Middle of the day... I'm just saying. Maybe it that, was two groups and one of them broke his leg. That's worries. It, that, that I'm worried about that. All I'm saying is if you see something wrong, like it's a little bit out of the ordinary with something, you got to think twice about it, right? If you see something, say something, as the, as the subway ads have it, and you said something. We, can we pause while I call the police? No. No, we can't. I'm not calling the police on Mormons. I'm calling the police on, police on Mormon imposters. No. And there is a huge difference. <laughs> I am worried. No. Um, uh, to the viewer, uh, and not the listener, the listener, I ask you, uh, please tell me, does Andy sound better than me? Because he's got a new mic. To yeah. the viewer, that's a new mic that Andy's got t- yeah. cl- crowd- crowding up like a third of the screen. Hope- I, am, I am hopeful that when the screen squeezes, when it puts my picture next to yours, most of this microphone will go away. Because I am it fascinated. Because it is enormous. It is a ginormous microphone, am, and I'm not going to buy one because it's worth my time. I have basically commandeered the Hubble telescope to capture my sound. A talking picture. Picture. Uh, all, right, all right, we have wasted so far it's too Friday. much time already. It's Friday. <laughs> we've got jobs, and we've got things to do. So what's, what's the list? Okay, the list. <laughs> I am saving the most special one for last, of course. One that I'm very excited for, and I didn't think I would be. A, a what is getting rave reviews from the people who review such things, a nifty little thriller called You're Next. Uh, the, the, the trailers look terrifying. The ads look terrifying. What they have done, it's, it's the, the people who are stalking the other people in this one wear like these animal masks. What they've done is they have taken other, uh, other movie posters, like, like 
I, I, probably not Despicable Me 2, but just for the juxtaposition, I'll use it. Like the Despicable Me 2 poster, but behind the image is the person in the a animal mask, and it is absolutely terrifying. It's such a... I am honestly not seeing this movie on the grounds of the of the advertising campaign because it's too scary. Okay. And okay. because the title is too aggressive. It's true. You're next. It's true. If you got killed going to that movie, people would be like, I mean... He was. They, they, they told you. Right. They, they, right. I mean... It's your, so, so, so your so your so your your desire here is to just not die stupid. Yeah, I mean, if skydiving was called jumping to your death, and then you yeah, did it, you died, everyone would be like, I mean, it's I mean, in the title. Told you, sure. Yeah. So before we get to the one that I'm most excited for, a few movies in limited release. So I can't tell you if they're coming out near you, but they're coming out near somebody, and by somebody I mean Phil. Uh, drinking buddies. Uh, yes. it, it looks like a normal romantic comedy, but the, ca the cast is lovely. There's Olivia Wilde, there's Jake Johnson, there's other people who I like. Um, it, it, looks, it looks cute, and mostly what I mean by that is the cast is made up of people that I trust. Uh, the Grand Master. There are, there, are two, um, there are two martial arts films of recent years called Ip Man. Ip Man I.P., Ip Man and Ip Man 2, and they are apparently amazing. They're on my queue. I haven't seen them yet. Starring Donnie Yen, and this, The Grand Master, is apparently a prequel, and and if it's anything like the first two, it will get Ray reviews, and I will see it years from now. Okay. Uh, Short Term 12. There's a limited release starring Brie Larson, who had, yep. who I have a ridiculous crush on, and she, and she I just is watched getting great reviews. Yeah. I just watched Twenty One Jump Street, and you should be having a crush on her. She's she's ridiculous. She is she is. And uh, and uh, adorbs. I adorbs. went on the movie's website to see when it is coming out. It actually has the release dates of where it's being released. Oh, and it's be that's what I'm doing. It's being released in L.A. It's being released in L.A. this week, but yeah. it's being released in Irvine, which is down the street from me, next week. So I'll be seeing that next week. Nice. Uh, like it. It's being released in North Carolina in Charlotte sometime next month. Have fun in Durham, buddy. It might come out sometime in 2014. You know what? VOD, man. I mean, I just, if I have to. Not, it sucks. I, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but right. I'll do it. And finally, folks, we come to it. By the time you see this, I will have already seen this movie. No uh, I am... This is the movie that I am more excited for than any other movie released in 2013. It is yes. The World's End. Yes. I, I can't even... I have goosebumps. I can't even say it without getting excited. Say it again. Say it again. The world's end. <laughs> Andy, why are, you, why are you so excited about this? Tell the world. Because if you are right-thinking people of, any, <laughs> of, of <laughs> any race, color, or creed, you have already seen and love Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. They are, not, they are made by the same director and star the, two, the, the same two guys who are best friends. These are three best friends. The director is Edgar Wright, who you also may know from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, a marvelous little movie. Simon Pegg, who you also may know from uh, from the last two Mission Impossible movies, and Nick Frost, who I'm not and sure what you he's would. He's Scotty know. from Star Trek. Oh he's yes, Scotty thank you, Trek. Scotty from Star Trek. That's how yes. most people would that that aren't geeks would recognize him. I think that's fair. I mean, Mission Impossible movies are big, but uh, but you're right. Nick Frost has he done anything that other people would know? It's I've, hard to say. They, they, they both, they start together again as best friends in the movie Paul, but you don't know him from that. Um, it's a weak movie. These are not sequels except in spirit. Uh, yeah, they they the are Dead. not, they are, right. Yeah, Shaun of the Dead is a zombie movie, is a zom rom-com, a zombie romantic comedy, which I love. Uh, the uh, uh, Hot Fuzz is a, an action movie comedy, uh, and, and I know you've seen funny action movies before, but it is a legitimate action movie, and it's funnier than any of the ones you've seen. It's amazing. Yeah. And this is, I think, and please no one spoil me, I think it looks like a science fiction movie. I don't want to say anything more about it. I don't want to know anything more about it. It looks like a science fiction invasion movie, and that's all I know. I am seeing them in marathon form from 5.30 p.m. to, I would guess, about half past midnight, uh, again, when you see this, I will have seen it last night, and I will have achieved Nirvana, basically. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'll achieve Nirvana, but I will be doing the same thing, by the way. Nice. I am also doing this thing that you just said. Yes. The, they, it is called 
the trilogy, again, it trilogy in spirit, not in plot or anything like that. The trilogy has two names. One, the Three Flavors Cornetto Trilogy. Cornetto is an English, a British right. ice cream treat. And in a scene in each one of them, they have uh, a character eats a different flavor of Cornetto. Uh, also known as the Blood and Ice Cream Trilogy. And honestly, folks, I'm not sure which one I like more. I'm not sure which, which title I like more. Uh, for those of you who are my friend on Facebook, and for those of you who aren't, what's the matter with you? For those of you who are my friends on Facebook, uh, notice my profile picture this week. It is topical. Uh, that'll That's do such it. a dork. Uh, yeah. Are you new? Uh, that'll do it for for this segment of our podcast. And we move on to our next segment. It's called uh, Creme de la Creme, where Phil and love I... It. I... I love it. I love it. It's Have nice. I mentioned I love the name of this segment? Well, you should. You came up with it. Uh, That's why I love the name of this segment. <laughs> it's where... It's where Phil and I invite one of uh, one of our most devoted followers to discuss movies of the of the guests choosing. And for our first installment of this, we have a very good friend of mine, a very good friend of the podcast, Damon Tomlin. Hello, Damon. Hey, everybody. Damon, hey. no pressure, but this is the first time we've done this segment, so I, I know I'm feeling it. The entire success or failure of this rests upon your your what looked to be very brawny shoulders. So. Um, Welcome to the only episode of Creme de la Creme. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it's one of those things where Andy and I spend so much time talking about the movies that we love, but I think what we wanted to do was figure out, we wanted to talk to the people, it's not just our devoted followers, but like the people, because we don't want to give people the idea that anyone who watches us will have on the show, because that's <laughs> not true <laughs> at all. But people that we know have good taste and that we trust, what's your favorite? Well, you know, we asked you, like, what are the things that, so you're the cream, and the creme de la creme, what are the things you love? And so, you know, we said, Damon, among other people, uh, what are the movies that you're excited to watch that are your favorite things, your favorite movies, definitive movies for you, uh, maybe for your lifetime or just of a genre that you love, any of those things. And uh, Damon, you're, you're number one guest, and uh, your response was what? What movies did you tell us to watch? Uh, actually, so not just one movie, but the combination of Alien and Aliens. Love it. So, right. so the first two in the franchise. Which, of course, my and I haven't watched, Andy, I know you've probably watched them all in the last year because you watch things so so often. But I had not watched Alien in about, I've been a few years, probably five or six years. I haven't seen Aliens since high school. <laughs> since wow. high school. Wow. And, um, I, and phenomenal, both phenomenal movies. But I really was wondering to myself, Damon, how could you possibly call these your favorite movies? They're they're just so depressing, <laughs> and 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 exhausting. And, so you're, uh, you're going the Ebert route then? I mean, I, I or Ebert's going my route. I mean, I have I, I'm not going the Ebert route. We just happen to agree. I mean, he makes a point in his article in his review that it's exhausting. Yes, yeah, of the second of the second one. I mean, a little yes, bit of the first one. Yeah, but the uh, first uh, one is just. First of all, is there? Andy pointed this out to me last year. Is there anybody? in film history who's got a more depressing timeline than Ripley. <laughs> I mean, her life is just suck city, right? It really is. It's true. Um, and it's just depressing. But before it's a depressing we... world that they portray. Oh, yes. I think, I, I mean, mean... Frodo takes one for the team. We shouldn't forget about that. <laughs> yeah, but... I, I mean, his life, that period in his life is so awful that he has to go to some other world to get away just from to it get all. A, but he gets to go to that world, and when he gets it's there, fair. Kate Blanchett's there. Okay. Like, fair if enough. I, I mean, if I, if I, if I had to, <laughs> I'd, I'd suffer through all that crap if at the end I got to hang, hang out in the Grey Havens with Clay, Kate Blanchett as an elf forever. That That's sounds fair. great. So, so Fro Frodo gets Kate Blanchett, and Ripley gets resurrected and gets to hang out with Dan Hedaya for it's a little exactly, bit. Exactly. Exactly. Tufts grad. Go Jumbos. Um, so, uh, so. Damon is? No. Dan Hedaya is. Yes, he is. Yes, yes. Yeah, Damon was there. With, at I was like, I don't remember Damon at all. Four years. This doesn't sound real. To You're a jerk. Um, yeah, I. You know, Ridley Scott, who who directed the first the first of our two movies, Alien, uh, and and I mean his art direction really informs the rest of the series. Uh, I think he did clearly that the sort of world building movie he's known for is Blade Runner. 
but I think he did as good or better a job of creating a world in in Alien. I th- it I is did just a better job of making a movie in Alien. Alien is just a much more I agree with that entertaining, as well. entertaining and rewatchable film. Agreed. I think. Agreed. With more layered and, performances. And, and his creating that world in Alien, I think, is all the more impressive by the fact that you don't actually see the world. You see seven people that sort of belong to it on a ship that it created. Right? You, you, that's, there that's there is well no said. other world than that. It's very, very well it's very evocative. Yes. Uh, do we want to? Do we want to? Oh, by the way, guys, this is good. Spoiler City. Both of these movies are are the the youngest of these two movies is over twenty five years old. So we are going to talk about these movies yeah. as if we you have seen them, and if you haven't, then go watch them and then come back and listen. Get your life together. I'm come back. Sure. Um, We'll refer to things that spoil up through the fourth one. I assume not that we want to. I have not three seen three. the fourth one, so I would prefer well, if we didn't. I I might prefer that if we did, so you never have to see the but, fourth one. We but, can tell you the good parts. My, my understanding, my understanding is that the fourth one spoils itself. Here, so here, here's the good part of the of, of the fourth one. There's this cool scene where uh, they swim. You don't really see that in any of the other three movies. That's it. You're now spoiled and, for all of the good parts in the fourth movie. I mean, it is a, it, it was made by Jean-Pierre Jeunet, who makes at least visually astounding movies. That's true. So I will be interested at least from that perspective. But okay, but let's go back to Damon for a sec. Damon, tell us a little bit about this movie and why about, it matters. About why, why I picked them? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'm a science fiction fan. Uh, always yeah. have been. Uh, but that's, that's just a, a setting. I, th- I think what I like so much about these movies... Um, is a the creature. I mean, the, 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 the creature, the alien, is obviously a centerpiece to the movie. Um, it's sort of interesting because you have both the protagonist and the and the same, effectively the same antagonist uh, throughout the series. Whereas in a lot of certainly in action movies, usually focus on the protagonist, and then we cycle through antagonists. Or in horror, you often have an antagonist that cycles through protagonists. <laughs> um, and I, I think this is sort of well interesting uh, in, in that you have both sort of constant threat. Now, granted, the, the alien is not the same individual alien every time, obviously. But um, but I like them for that reason. I think it's also the reason I picked the, the first two and not just one uh, is that I think it does an amazing job of transitioning from the first one, which is... A, a horror movie. Yeah. Uh, to the second one, which is an action movie. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, an action movie, but a horrific action movie. And, oh, sure. And, uh, and I think the second one does. Let me put it this way: they could have very easily just chosen not to follow Ripley in the second one and just done something else, but and it would have been fine. But after the second one, you don't make an alien movie without Ripley. Right. So right. what the second one does is it solidifies not like the first one is about this crew. And Sigourney Weaver's character uh, Ripley is the one who survives. Right. But and the cat. As as of the sec, whatever. As <laughs> I'm convinced after watching that movie that that cat was responsible for at least three of those deaths. The, if you're okay. not a dog person after watching Alien, I don't want to know you. It's right, ridiculous. Right. Right. That cat is responsible for the deaths of yes. many people. Shame on you, whatever your name is. And then one, Jones. I was watching. I was watching Mike it with Jones, a friend. Jonesy. Right. I was watching it with a friend who is a cat person, and she said, she said, no, don't you like the cat hissed. Uh, like the cat hissed when uh, the alien was nearby, and I was like, "Right, it was basically saying to the alien, I got one for you.' Like, <laughs> here you go." Poor Harry Dean Stanton. Yeah, yeah. Um, Harry Dean Stanton did not deserve that fate. No, n- I, none of those people. Let's. Well, yeah, you know I, mean, I think that, that's one Tom of the great Scarrett. things. Tom Scarrett might have deserved the fate, and uh, that woman was so whiny. Nancy something or other was Veronica, so whiny. Veronica Cartwright. I think. Yeah. Here's here's and then I, Damien, you're about to say something. I want to go back to it. Sure. Uh, uh, here's I want to talk about the cast in detail because I think the cast, especially the first one, is just there is not a weak link. And I think what Veronica Cartwright's character does is is she provides a counterpoint to Ripley even before Ripley is you know as as Sigourney Reaver herself put it, Rambo Lena uh, in the second right. one and and onward. Uh, and actually, upon watching mm-hmm. Aliens again. She's Rambolina for a very, very small amount of time. It is. It is movie. really what's amazing about. Well, first of all, I hope you all know she was nominated for Best Actress for her part. For and her portrayal I'm of so Ripley glad you said that. that. 
in Aliens, she absolutely deserves it. What are the odds yes. on that happening today? Yeah. Uh, like, a thousand to one? I think to the one? odds were pretty weird back then, too. When you look at the yeah, people sure. that were nominated, I mean, it, it, it was a statement. It really was. And it's a statement that she is deserved. She is a phenomenal actress. And, uh, um, and on top of that, the performance is a very, very layered awesome yes you know i mean it's it is a career defining performance and the whole rambolina thing i mean literally that's the last 20 minutes of 15 minutes of the movie i mean it shows her becoming this thing it's the it's the sort of origin story of a badass so to speak yeah it's sort um, of like watching ash in evil dead too like right he's not awesome the whole time it takes him to a point by the time he gets to army of darkness he's like well, I have to be this kind of person. Right. I, I, I might, I might disagree even with the last 20 minutes, but we'll get there. Damon, uh, tell us. Talk to us. Oh, uh, well, one thing you were, when you were talking about the, the cast, it's a great ensemble. Um, and one of the things that I, I like about Alien is I'm actually not that big a horror fan. Um, you know, I've seen some, uh, you know, I mean, I've enjoyed some, but I, I certainly can't claim to be an expert in the genre. Um, it's, it's an impossible genre to enjoy. I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's not an enjoyable That's, genre. Uh, Andy's got his disagree face. So. I will. Um, have you been, have you been exactly. listening? Have you been listening to? Uh, have you been listening to horror school? As it is, I have. As, as, and and are you with me generally that we talk about something and it's just horrifying? And I'm like, I guess that's what just happened to my face. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, especially the you know the the splatter genre. I just never been on board with. I mean, I I understand being you know sort of thrilled by it because it's exciting and jumps out and scares you. But, you know, between the, well, I think you guys call them the boo scares and suspense, I, th- I think it's suspense is a more fun. Agreed. No, I, I, I agree to work in. I absolutely, uh, I agree with that. But what, what I was going to say about the cast is, is that, you know, the, one of the things I also like about the first one uh, is that it's unconventional in the horror genre because it's, it's a group of adults. Um, yes. You know, they're all at least, well, I, I think Veronica Cartwright was 29 when they made it. But yeah. they, and Sigourney the Weaver is 30. Yes. The youngest people are like basically twenty nine and thirty. Yeah, and so, so so it's not a bunch of teenagers. And what that one of the things that leads to, it, or it might have been caused by, is is that none of them make a series of terrible decisions. <laughs> and, and and I always wonder about that about in, in the horror genre whether whether when they're writing a horror movie whether, whether they said I need a group of people to make a series of terrible decisions. <laughs> teenagers really fit that bill. Or Perfect. I want to make a, I want to make a movie about teenagers. What do teenagers do? Terrible oh, they make things. really horrible decisions, right? And, um, have to, and 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 sleep with people with uh, with with uh, or are always thinking about sex to a frequency that is ridiculous. Exactly. In an alien, in alien, and in aliens, there's no there's no sex. There's no suggestion of sex. There's some chemistry between some characters and aliens, mm-hmm. and there might have been some chemistry between uh, Sigourney Weaver's character and Tom Skerritt's character in Alien. Yeah, they, they thought that right. But but there's chemistry which yes. is different from and then here's just a random scene where they're doing it what and 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 one of the things um about this group of adults is i, I think they rather than had a, have a bunch of hysterical teenagers running around they took all the hysterics in the alien that would have been attributed to that group of people in alien <laughs> and and condensed it all and shoved it into veronica cartwright stuffed it into one person Be- because there are points at which you almost can understand what she's saying it, it, well it's, it's so great. funny if you haven't seen if you haven't seen alien guys there's a point where they the guy is out like searching for this thing and it's got like a, a um you know like a, a radar like a doop Dude, like a sensor for if it's getting closer or further away. Right. Now, Nancy Cartwright's character is the one that's talking to the person on the on the overhead, like on their earphone thing while they're she's they're walking through. And she's like, oh my God, it's getting closer. Oh my can you imagine if you were the person you want to have someone who's like, all right, here's the deal. I need you to you need someone who's calm on the phone. Right. Like this she inspires yeah. utter terror <laughs> like you are the person can, can you imagine like, being Dallas like uh can, can you put Parker on for a while <laughs> can you put uh, anyone else on the phone like, put anyone else on the phone you are terrifying you can right you can keep freaking out but if I could just keep hearing the ping of the thing that will kill me I get it I get you're, it you're, you're you're covering up the sound that could save my life. Yeah. If that's, and, I if that's that's bit, and I felt that way a little bit of Bill Paxton's character in Aliens. It was a little bit one Veronica note, although Cartwright, Bill Paxton Veronica does a great job. became Bill Paxton in the second movie. Yeah. What were you going to say? She was re- so, reincarnated. Uh, Damon? I was going to two two things. First, with that, that motion sensor, the beep, beep. Uh, if you're Dallas, how much do you wish that thing showed in three dimensions as opposed to two when you're... Uh, right. that, 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 that's one of the, you know... 
funny points about that motion sensing device. Oh, it shows perfect resolution, but only in two dimensions. They they could be off anywhere on that on that third axis. Right, it could um, be above you, below you. That's yeah, and, and that's how that's how he gets in trouble. Uh, right. The other thing is the on a, on a more interesting note, the similarity between that and how they show the shark and jaws, right? A lot of the time you don't see that shark. You see either the barrels or you see the little flashing device yeah. attached to the barrels and it beeps. So if you can hear the if you see the barrels or you hear the beeps. Yeah. Like that's how yeah. they demonstrate the menace of the creature without actually showing the creature. Yeah. I, I that's 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 something really oh, sorry, Phil, just real quick. The two movies that it, that that at least the first one reminds me of, uh it, it reminds me of Jaws, and it's because even at the until you see it like flying away at the end of the movie, you don't get a clear look at that entire yeah. body, and it's just like it's just like how you, the shark is saved for the end, right? Yeah. Like that's when it's sort of pulled out. The other movie it reminds me of is Die Hard, because Die Hard is an action movie where nothing happens but people talking for twenty minutes. The first 15, 20 minutes, it is, it is. I think it's between. It's either between like. It's either around like eight minute eighteen, or it's between minute twenty and twenty five when John Hurt gets the face hugger. It's 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 oh, yeah. it, actually it's like thirty minutes. Is it is it's it like that long? Thirty minutes. Yeah. Awesome. Guess how long before you see an alien in Aliens? Guess how long? The how first long? alien sighting. I didn't check. How long? One well, hour. Is, is that One. is that counting the, the face huggers in Medbay? Uh, or is that, that like full size? No, alien? it does not count those. It counts the actual like alien yeah. sighting. One full hour. That's phenomenal. That yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. Everyone making a movie today, everyone, save the MacGuffin for a later reel. Right. Whatever right. you have right. it, push it back 20 minutes. Your movie yeah. will be better yeah. for it. Yeah. Yes. I sort of feel like saying everyone making a movie today, go to school first and find out what a MacGuffin is because you probably don't even know that, you uneducated <laughs> Philistines. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know why I just um, got angry and get off my lawn about life. But no, um, it's fine. It's fine. So, it's clearly to, to let you guys know. It's 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 a kind of muffin. It's a really deli- it's a MacGuffin muffin. It's the best kind of muffin. <laughs> it's a McMuffin. Um, yes. Uh, so so let's. I want to go. I want to go back to the art direction of, of of Alien, and we could talk about it as as it as it pertains to to aliens as well. But I love like it is one of the most claustrophobic movies I have ever seen. Everything is dark, but not in a way. It, there, there is an art to lighting something dark with darkness. It, yes, it, you know because because you know a camera pointed at a black room is not interesting, and it's not even scary. You're just seeing a black screen, right? You need to see, you need to show just enough so you know what's in there, like right. the scene where the cat is Satan and leads Harry Dean Stanton right to his death. Um, or, or where Veronica Cartwright and Yafet Kodo, Kodo buy it. Um, yep. But even when there's light, there is, I can't think of light in, this, in the entire movie that isn't fluorescent. It is depressing mm-hmm. and, and lacking all warmth. And you are just, oh, it's just like you are, it's light that says you can see stuff, but you're still alone. And I love that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 adding to that, you know, when a, uh... When Brent, the Harry Dean Stanton's character, right before he gets killed, you know, he walks into the what I can only assume is the is the condenser part of the the reactor because he's got a, it's raining in the in the spaceship, right? It's a huge cavernous space, and you know he takes off his hat unless the the water splashes his face, and that's that's where Harry Dean Stanton goes for refreshment is a giant <laughs> dark cavernous room with chains hanging down jingling. That's the most and, that's the most relaxing like, place. That's, there is. Thank God that, I'm that, here. <laughs> Yeah, in, in the Nostrobo, that is Maui. <laughs> I want to I want to point out as you bring this up, there was a problem where he did deserve to die in the sense that like he stopped and did that moment of like refreshment. You do know that even though you don't realize how big this thing has gotten, that it has already killed one member of your team violently. <laughs> right. And well, even though it, you don't know it, what it, it is, even though you don't. Yeah, but what so you just, saw don't, come don't out. Don't let him in, Harry Dean Stanton, and then you're fine. No, but what you saw come out was this thing that looks like this, with big bean teeth, and then ran faster than lightning. And then you were like walking along, and you're like, "Oh, look, it molted." When does that happen? When things get bigger. Anyway, look, there's some water over there. La la la. Time for a fresca. I would be, I would be like, uh, "What happened to Jonesy?" And be like, "He's dead." 
You saw him die? No, no, but we're done with him. <laughs> Let's all lock ourselves in this room now. Indeed. That's how I would be about the whole thing. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I, uh, let's talk about the chest bursting scene because it is just, it's, I love. It's classic cinema. It, it really is. It is, it is an indelible moment in film history. Uh, I can't, I can't think of a more iconic moment in horror. I think I can actually say that. I can't think of one. Do you know the time, do you know how I was introduced to that scenario? Was it Spaceballs? It was Spaceballs. <laughs> I saw Spaceballs long before I saw Alien. Sure. That's fair. <laughs> and it was John Hurt both yeah. times. But yeah, they got John Hurt. So. That's, that's right. That, which which I, I love British actors because they're like, T- I'll totally make fun of myself. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's a I, paycheck in it, yeah. yes. Right. I had a hard time, actually, when I finally saw Alien and the alien jumped out of his chest and didn't go, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime girl. I was like really disappointed. Yeah, but then so. you were too busy peeing yourself for the next 45 I was, minutes, so it's fine. I think Alien might be the first horror movie I ever saw. Nice. Pretty sure I saw it when I was 13, and I don't remember watching a horror movie before then. Yeah. So nice. there you I, go. I find I find myself really liking horror movies, and Damon, maybe you maybe you can speak to this because because you mentioned I, I, I agree. I, I guess I'm agreeing with myself because you you mentioned that we say it, so I agree with myself. Uh, like the boo scares are fine. I mean, I certainly I certainly appreciate them when they're done well, but. It's the atmospheric stuff, the stuff that the stuff that s- confuses you because because something is off, uh, and and I think that I think that the chest burster scene because everybody remembers him like it, it was obvious, for obvious reasons they remember the thing actually coming out of his chest, but the beginning of that scene on purpose is super boring. They are sitting and they are eating, and that is it, and then and then all of a sudden he, he's like oh. Like, there's like a split second of, oh, oh, these noodle things disagreed with me. And then, and then he's shaking and he goes on shaking for a really long time. And so right. for most of it, it is scary because you don't know what's going on. I mean, right. and it's not like, I mean, it's not like you've forgotten the face hugger. You like, you can pretty much figure out why it's happening, but like. But, but you don't know what's going to happen. Yes, you don't know yeah. what's going to happen. And then what happens is the worst thing you could possibly imagine. The single worst thing ever. A ginor- a, 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 a monster that simultaneously looks like male and female genitalia at the exact same time. That's amazing. <laughs> Bursts out of your stomach in this sort of bizarro, like bizarro labor scene on a man. And then I- I- immediately exploding your heart, by the way, killing you instantly. Sc- screeching at everybody in the room and then bursting away. Forget it. Right. Scare- if it had, if it had screeched and then stuck around ready to fight, that wouldn't have been as scary as disappearing. Agreed. Oh sure. You, you can't claim the alien is not strategic. Like, uh, uh, wait a second, I'm gonna go get <laughs> really big in the next 45 minutes, and then we can talk again. How uh, does he look like? Right. How does he look like a P and a V at the same time? It is amazing. That's H.R. Geiger. It's true. It's true. The man did, for, for those who don't know, H.R. Geiger is the guy who did the creature design. And, yep. I mean, yep. job well done, dude. Yeah. yeah Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, he's a, he's a um, and I say this with admiration, he's a sicko. Yeah, right. Like, look at his art. Go online and look at his art. Totes. You're not going to, I mean, there's no way that he's happy about anything. Um, How's that cinnamon toast crunch, Mr. Geiger? <laughs> uh, it'll go away soon. It'll be soggy. <laughs> Uh, like life. Let's. I I I, I, well, I I we're belaboring this point at this uh, uh, by now, but I, I gotta I gotta be honest. It drives me nuts when she goes back for the cat. Okay. Just drives me nuts. It's who she is though. It's who she is. I I know. I, I'd le- I'd rather see her loving up on Newt in Aliens than loving up on Jonesy, because Newt well, but, is. Oh well, I mean, fine, and she does, and actually the the, the themes of. See the first one, and this is this is. I don't think Ridley Scott develops uh, develops characters, he, the humanity of characters. I should say, he develops characters that are memorable. Yes, I agree with that. He does. Yeah. But I don't think he actually develops the humanity of characters quite the way. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but seriously, James Cameron does. <laughs> Look, James sure. Cameron. 
from a storytelling standpoint and from a character development standpoint, has gotten much deserved flack for Titanic and Avatar. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's for the recent but when, but But let me right. list his right. first five movies. Terminator, Aliens, Terminator 2, True Lo- uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, the Abyss. Yeah. Terminator 2, True Lies. Those movies are all chock full of Incredibly engrossing characters. That's abs- that's so well. And said. That's all very, of that's them. Point. And all, every single one, all of them have fascinating female protagonists yes. who are all strong in their own way. Mm-hmm. Which For, is why I thought it was so funny when True Lies came out and people said that it was a misogynistic film. I was like, I, are we watching the same movie? <laughs> because because a man is calling a woman the B word. This is all of a sudden a misogynistic movie. Like. The like the woman the women in that movie are legitimately great. Yeah, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis is totally fumbling and bumbling because she's a housewife who's never been seen violence before. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you get to see her develop as a character throughout Amazing. that yes. movie. And, and then Linda Hamilton in both Terminator films, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio in The Abyss, and really, I mean, Ripley. Again, I say it again. I think I think James Cameron does more for developing the character of Ripley than any of the other alien films that I have seen. I've only seen oh, the first oh, three, sure. but I mean that's sure. absolutely right. That's that's absolutely right. It's I think I and, and I love that you said that. I, I, I agree with you about his his uh his sort of penchant and 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 you know ability in developing not only characters but female characters. It's right, I, I right. Mean, he can't I mean he can't stay married to a to a strong female, but he can certainly write for them and direct them. And that, yeah, I mean, good, and you know, well on him, well done him. I mean, yeah. realistically, I mean, it's prob- marriage is hard, so I, I get it. And I, and I, I mean, assume. and and my guess, and my guess is he's a jerk. I'm just guessing he's a jerk. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, he's probably a jerk. But he's a jerk that respects women. There's something to that. Phil, he's the king of the world. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so one last thing that I want to say, and we could certainly we can go back and forth from Alien to Aliens as much as you want, but something I, I, I want to bring up before I'm kind of done with my own stuff about Alien. Uh, the the ending, yet again, and, and yes, I say like this is an ending that would never be done today, but it wasn't done then. It was just a really well done ending. She doesn't, if that movie were a lesser movie, she would have had more to do with the Alien's death. She would have hit it with a pipe or she would have turned into She-Hulk or something. But what she does is she gets into a spacesuit, buckles herself in, hits it with the jet of steam, and then like gets herself even more firmly and safely ensconced and just opens the door. And that's yep. it. And yep. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I-, I would say even further, if it was more of a traditional, if it was more, if it was a lesser film, then it would have shown like, it would have been like the last shot would have been her asleep and then like pan out to the outside of the of the ship and the alien is still clinging to the ship. It's true. <laughs> like that would have been. <laughs> dun, right. dun, dun. That's right. That's like, right. That would have been the way they ended that movie and they didn't. Um, do you? Oh, oh. When Dallas is it? When Tom Skerritt is in the is in the tunnels and right when he dies, when he turns around and and the aliens like. <laughs> Right. I have seen this movie. And even I'm, the alien like reaches out with the hands. It's yes. very ridiculous. I've seen this movie. It wouldn't surprise me if I've seen this movie 15 times. It just wouldn't okay. surprise me at all. Okay. Every single time that scares me. I'm like It doesn't scare me because oh for some reason as much because as much oh, sure, because sure. the hands just look like some dude in a puppet's hands. Well, I, I, I think the problem is that I think that shot lingers a quarter second too long. Like okay. if the hands were shooting out, I think it would be scarier. I, I think also I wish it were shorter because you see a lot of the creature there. And as we said, it's better to see as little of the creature as possible for as long as possible. I think that's that both of you are totally right. I think the reason that I find it, I still find it effective is I think for that last quarter second, I think my eyes are probably closed. So (laughs) I'm getting the perfect shot. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. (laughs) Uh, Go ahead, Damon. I've got two things I want to say about Alien before we move on. Sure. Please. So if yours are short, go ahead, Phil. No, please do. Oh, okay. Um, so I, have con- I have a conspiracy I have a conspiracy theory. So you uh, go first. Well, Mine might that. be the shorter then. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we haven't talked about the character of Ash at all, which is mm. the Ian Holm character. And and one of the things we that I think are so inter- that's, that's so interesting about Ash is that he sort of progresses in terms I, mean, I, I never saw it coming, spoiler alert, that he's a robot, right? 
Yes. Um, so, so at first you think, okay, well, he's just sort of a, a quirky science officer. Like he does a little exercise thing, you know, when, when he's about right. to, when they're about to go out right. to the alien ship, he's a grown man drinking milk in the middle of this lab with a specimen. <laughs> like, okay, that's a little weird. Um, but at first I think he's just, just a weirdo. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you think, okay, well, he's a little slimy. Um, because clearly he just wants this creature because maybe it's a scientific curiosity. And then it right. turns out the company wants him to have the creature. And so you, you sort of see him develop as a secondary antagonist. But you never you, none of the things that you see him do that are weird or seem creepy, you would ever attribute to him being a robot until it's <laughs> obvious that he is. And I think that's really right. an, an interesting choice to make him both a secondary antagonist and a robot. And one of those you're not going to see coming. Right. That's that, that's yes yes I I love I love the milk thing. It's like well it, I mean it's not like a hot day so go ahead um, milk is a bad choice milk. it's probably delicious in space that's <laughs> that's right um, in space no one can hear you scream I'm not but but milk is always delicious I am not a medical doctor or okay. a coroner or a biologist of any kind hmm. how is he going to kill her with the rolled up magazine is it that's suffocation <laughs> is suffocation. It, is it, Suffocation. Except, except by virtue of being a rolled up magazine, it's got a hole down the middle. Like, basically, I'm going to kill you with a snorkel. Like, suffocation's going to be a hard one to pull off. I think if you jam it all the way to the back of her throat, you can gag her. And, That's right. I mean, make her That's choke right. on her I, I always, vomit. I, I always just thought that was the ash is malfunctioning so badly at that point. That's, I mean, clearly he's stronger than her. He could just right. hit her in the head. Could've ju- he could have right. just crushed her windpipe and called That's, it a day. What, yeah. I f- what I find interesting about it is, and I love what you said, Damon, it, it's so true. Like, like, for just a second there, you're like, Wait a minute. How is, like, something... how is he holding her down right. with one hand right. as he's doing this with it? Like, right. like she, maybe in right. general, men are stronger than women, but Ian Holm is not a big guy. He's a, he's a tiny man. Sigourney Weaver is not a small woman. Ian and... Holm is actually in my pocket right now. He's <laughs> just hanging adorable. out. He's just hanging out. He's yes. adorable. He's pocket sized. Um, but you don't, uh, you don't, yes, it's, it, you know how, it's so weird that it, it adds to the creepy factor. Sorry, Phil, go ahead, go ahead. Do you know how tall Sigourney Weaver is? Is she six feet tall? She's 5'11 and a half, yeah. Wow. You know what? We'll I'll just, give her we'll that. We'll just round half. it up. I we'll will. round it up. If wow. she's wearing heels, you win, which <laughs> she is in Ghostbusters. Um, nice. So so here here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> she, sleeps, she sleeps above the covers. Six feet <laughs> above the covers. Okay, so... Um, so a couple things that I want to throw out there. One is I think the violence, uh, the, the strangeness of the violence and the feeling of the violence, the panickiness of the violence when he rolls up this paper and sticks it in her mouth is, is part of what makes it work. So even though yes. watching it the third or fourth time, you go, magazine? But the first time <laughs> it just feels so wrong i totally agree with you yes and, it, and yeah. it goes really in 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 its very subtle ways if you just want to look at the sort of and they talk about this if you read some of the commentaries or articles about it or look on wikipedia this or that about how they worked to make you sexually uncomfortable watching this movie that there is something really sexually uncomfortable and violent about jamming something down a woman's throat to try to kill her i mean it felt very That's, it's violent yeah, yes Choking her is what it is. Right. That was like memorable in a very horrific way. So I yeah. respect that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So two things I want to say. Okay. One is my conspiracy theory. Are you ready? I probably not, but hit us. The movie is called Alien. Wait. I'm with you. Who are the real aliens in this movie? Is Everybody. it really? I mean, is it really the creature? Where? That's not our planet. No, I mean, well, it's, it's not, the, it's it's not, not their planet, planet either. either. It's not their it's planet no, either. Sure, it's not their planet either, but we go to that planet and find them. Like, there's no proprietariness to this. Like, okay. there's nothing inherently evil about the alien. Like how like how in Predator, it's actually Arnold Schwarzenegger who is ostensibly the Predator. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you so ah, far. Well, in that, the, prey, the Predator becomes the prey, right? The hunted becomes the hunter. Indeed. But, I, but I'm just saying, like, like if you want to look at this movie as social commentary, which it's pretty easy to do considering the company is called The Company, <laughs> and, they are, and, and, and all they care about is money to the degree of doing some evil, evil stuff, mm. there's also this notion of like, oh, yeah, no, that's an alien, not us. Oh, really? Are you on Earth? 
oh no, you're just on some planet you decided to mine for riches. So and, I'm and saying, I think that's a, oh, go ahead. No, that's it. Where who's the alien here? I, I think that becomes an even bigger issue for aliens insofar as James Cameron has this whole Vietnam angle right. on this thing. Right. And yes. it's like, you know, aliens, there's more aliens. Yeah, I know. They brought more soldiers. <laughs> like as same <laughs> after we put a colony there. Right? I, yeah. it's just I mean it's that's I'm, that, that's really interesting. I'm I'm coming that's, around. That's, that's all. That's all I want to say about it. It's not a big, and I don't want to belabor the point because I think uh, it'll fall apart. But I, but I also, <laughs> but I think it, I don't know that they thought it through that much. Sure. To be completely honest. I, and the reason I want to say that, what I, one of the strengths of Alien, is how evocative it is. And one the way something is good at one of the ways something is good at being evocative is by what it chooses to leave out. And the well, thing sad. I want to say to finish up on Alien is. I saw Prometheus in the theater when it came out, mm -hmm. and have we all seen Prometheus? Yeah. Yep. Which is funny because Ridley Scott was saying initially that this is not a prequel to Alien. Okay, okay dude. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I hadn't seen Alien in so long that I was willing to accept the premise of that. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen Alien in so long that while I thought Prometheus was not very good at dealing with the questions that it posed, and that was its biggest problem, I still was really loved so much of Prometheus and was really impressed by so much of Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Upon watching Alien again, it makes Prometheus a worse movie by far. <laughs> because all the stuff that I found amazing, I was like, oh wait, that's the exact same ship from Alien. Oh, we saw all this stuff exactly in Alien and now all it's doing is going, hey, remember this stuff that we just kind of left evocatively and open-ended yeah. and curious the, and weird. The skeleton gonna, of the, of of the engineer in the big yeah. gun, Which absolutely. Is, and and now, now we're just going to come through and connect the dots and tell you what all those things really were. That, that becomes yes. all Prometheus is. Yeah. Prometheus is just them. I mean, it, you know what it becomes? Ready for it? Hmm. A prequel. <laughs> it's a, it's, but I mean, and that's all. It's a, a gorgeous empty thing gorgeous yes. gorgeous i yes you, it's it's the as as phil and i have discussed and, and damon maybe you maybe you heard this episode of project melway the uh the, the road warrior has the my favorite opening and closing narrations of all time because they give you more questions than they give you answers mm -hmm. right and and that's what alien does and that's the exact opposite of what prometheus does prometheus gives sure. you all sorts of answers that you didn't really have I wasn't asking that question. Too. Right. And then asks all sorts of questions that we've been asking for thousands of years yeah. and then kinds of it kind of answers them but not really. Not really. Yeah. Disappointing. Uh, I uh, so, so please no please Damon, Damon go. So so one of the um well I think about Prometheus that I was a little I mean I, I enjoyed it let's be honest. Mm, me um, too. But but one of the things I was sort of disappointed in is it seemed to have, it, 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 as Phil said, it, it sort of lifted the, the coolest features of Alien and then filled in some sci-fi horror elements that I didn't think needed to be there. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that we want to spoil Prometheus, but there are certain things in that movie that are reminiscent of John Carpenter's The Thing, yep. which while I love John Carpenter's The Thing, I don't think you need to merge those two... <laughs> Styles. Then it's not. It's not chocolate and peanut butter. Oh my god! How, how has no one put these two things together before? Right. Right. You got Carpenter and my Ridley Scott. <laughs> right. Although uh, Ebert, Ebert points out that that Alien feels like a remake of the original Howard Hawks, the thing. The, the thing. The, the thing from another world. Oh yeah. Right. That's true. Um, that's that, so, that's fair. So. But what, I hear what, what you're saying. What one thing I want to—I guess we're transitioning to aliens now. Or yeah, that, say whatever you talk about. Yeah. Whatever you want to talk yeah. about. So, yeah. so the, in the transition, the, the, there's there's one thing. One of the reasons I love these movies is is like I said because of the creature itself. And one of the things that's I think unique about the creature is that sure it it, it kills you violently, um, but that's true of a lot of sure. horror movies. <laughs> oh, that that's a Donald. Um, <laughs> and 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 you know, but 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 a lot of horror movies, the primary antagonist. Sure, it can, you know it, it shoves a knife through you, or it shoots you, or it you know bludgeons you to death, or what have you. Hmm. Um, but like there, you do, like you do. Uh, but I think one of the key elements of Alien and, and the Alien and how it kills people is that it uses because it implants this embryo, and because you you're, you you effectively die in the service of letting this thing reproduce. Right. Um, and that is so it's using human beings what we call instrumentally. Uh, 
as opposed to just incidentally we? killing you. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. So when um, there's been some, I'm a scientist, so I, I, do, I look at. Wait a minute. Holy crap. We haven't even <laughs> talked about that. Damon, what do you do for a living? I don't know you, dude. Like, what do you do for a it's living? True. Why are you on our show? Uh, so, this is what so, we should have done. If we were if we were better hosts, we would have done this at the very beginning. He's on our show because he's the creme de la creme. That doesn't answer anything. That's I want to know. I want to know. That's I know fair. you're friends with Andy. I know y'all went to, to grade school together. And That's the Prometheus answer. Give, but give I'm him the fascinated, alien answer. But I'm fascinated <laughs> by. I'm fascinated by. So so you're a scientist. What kind of science do you? Do so science? I, I I study human decision ma- decision making and how it's instantiated in the brain. Um, wow. And in, in particular, I study human social decision making. So how? Why haven't we been talking about this the entire time? Oh my gosh! It's it's not as cinematic as it as it might sound, I guess. Um, no, but it must make watching horror films amazing. Like you were talking earlier about people making terrible decisions. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and, and, and one of the things is this: an alien, the ensemble cast, doesn't make terrible decisions, or at least they don't make ill-advised decisions in the in ignorance that they're ill-advised. Like right. Tom Skerritt. Go, you know, sure, he goes into the creepy crawly space with the alien running around hunting, trying to hunt him. But there's a scene beforehand where he's sitting down at the computer asking, is there anything else I could possibly do than walk <laughs> into this tunnel with a dinky flamethrower? Right. And the computer says, nope, sorry, I got nothing. That's what we got, right. Great. And, Thanks, and, and you know, so, so, so and, and Brent, you know, maybe he knows how big the creature is, but probably not. Like, none of these people sort of say, oh, I'm going to take this thing solo because I'm that cool. Right, uh, right. Anyway, so, so yeah, studying it from a, a decision-making perspective is, in, is interesting, but also uh, some of the work that's tangentially related to what I do is looking at human moral decisions. I've lost Phil. Phil has lost interest. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, human moral decision-making. And, and so looking at how, okay. uh, at how people, you know, people are faced with an ethical quandary of some sort, how do you, how do you make that decision? What, what are the parameters of the, of the decision that influence which way you go. So one of the classic examples is what's called the trolley problem. And the trolley problem is this. Uh, there's a runaway trolley going on a track, and the way it's going, there are five workers working on the rail. They can't get out of the way. The trolley's going to run over them. But there, you're next to a switch, which you can throw. And if you switch the track, the trolley will go down this other route. It won't kill the five. But there's one worker on that track, and he's going to die. So, do you throw the switch or not? You can wow. have, feel feel free to answer that question. Do you throw the switch? I'm I I, I abstain. Okay. You can't, well, abstaining kills people. Yeah, abstain, if you abstain, abstain you kill you kill five, five people. people. I yeah. think I think I cannot pretend that if I I can't pretend that at least part of my calculus would be how well I know various people among those six. Uh, no, sure. I'm, I'm serious. Like, yeah, I assume they're all strangers. You know, then, it, then I, then it's an the experiment needs of like the many. control for everything. There's no I, other detail than what right. I've given. Then the needs so we don't of the know. Many. We don't know if I mean, any of them are hot. No, no, they're all they're all clones. Actually, all five. Are um, they hot clones? Yes. I would I would probably. Throw they they are the hottest clones you've ever seen. Um, then that's and, a, and so so yeah. most people opt to throw the switch in that scenario. Yeah. Now, here's, here's an alternative. Same trolley, same five guys, only now there's no switch. Now you're on a bridge that's going over the track, and there's a large guy on the bridge. And you can push him off, he'll land on the track, and that guy will stop the train. And then the other five will live. Do you push the guy off the, tra- off the bridge? Most people wow. say no. Most people say even no. Though that, even though it's technically the same exact scenario, but now you actually have blood on your hands. Like you actually see the person and come in contact. So, so there, there, there are two. Your there are agency two, is different, though. Clearly, in that, in that. So there, 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 okay. there's two go dimensions ahead, ahead, that, chain, that seem to change how people treat that problem. One is the physical proximity. You have to physically push someone as opposed to throwing a switch. It's, it's more right. impersonal that way. Right. But the other is, and, it, and you can change the scenario this way and that, to where you can isolate different elements. Um, and, and one of the elements that's important is also, is the person being used instrumentally or not? So in the first scenario, the guy's death is incidental. Right. It, it's unfortunate, but you didn't need that to happen to save either five. In the second one, that guy is stopping the train. You are killing him in order to save the other five. His death is, is a critical component in that. 
uh, and most people don't find it acceptable for both those reasons. And so we we seem to have this innate uh, aversion to using people, especially if it's going to harm them, using them instrumentally. And I think a with the alien plugs into that feeling that if you want to kill somebody, you stab them. You know they're they're dead, but it's okay. incidental versus you're dead because I need you to reproduce my species. Um, so I, I think that's one of the cool things about Alien. Um, the other, as we go into Aliens, is that they've really got a, a perfect setup for this villain. It's, a, a, it's the perfect villain because it's just a killing machine, right? It, it doesn't right. have secondary motivations. It doesn't care about money or, or anything. It just wants to kill you right. and reproduce. Yep. Um, and, which, and, which James Cameron likes, right? I mean, because that's pretty much, you basically just paraphrase the famous line from Terminator, right? It right. will not stop ever until you right. are dead. Right, yeah. Um, and, and so I think one of the reasons it's, that it makes us transition so well uh, from horror to action, and then just a, a second, having a second movie in general, is that, um, as, as I mentioned before, in horror, you generally have center around the antagonist and cycle through protagonists. In action, the, the hero kills the bad guy in the first one, and then you've usually got to come up with a second bad guy. Yeah. Your alternative right. is to resurrect the first bad guy. Right. And, we, we, and and so either one of those, you either usually end up with with an imperfect second bad guy, or you resurrect the, the first bad guy, and now the first movie feels kind of hollow because you didn't really accomplish anything. Right. Here, yes. they've got, you know, they, well, they killed it's like, the, think they, about So a great example of that is you mentioned horror movies, right? And you talked about how it's instead of the protagonist cycling through antagonists, it's the antagonist cycling through protagonists, which I love, by the way. That is a phenomenal description of horror movies. But the other thing is, who cares if at the end of the movie you kill Freddy? Yeah. Because we know there's going to be a Freddy 700. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what's uh, the difference? Yeah. And, 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 and so here, because they have this perfect villain, but in, in, and obviously this is unintentional because Ridley Scott never meant to make a second one, you've got that whole chamber full of eggs. You've got a ready-made group of yeah. bad guys that are exactly like the first right. one. Right. And because they're all sort of anonymous, you know, there's, there's no identifying characteristics for any of them. You, right. can, you can have a villain that's as terrifying as the first one, and yet you don't have to resurrect them. So I, I think that's one of the reasons it's so great to have the aliens come back. You, all, you also have, in both cases, the point of the movie is not to destroy the villain so much as it is really just to get to safety. Right. And just so, to survive it. So yeah. you don't so so it's actually just like you pointed out, like vanquishing the villain in movies you vanquish the villain and then you're like, haha, I've done that. Now the world is safe, at least for a time, from blankety blank. But in this movie <laughs> it's just I'm safe now. For now. Yeah. Right. I'm safe. Right. And there's no pretending that it's beyond that. Yeah. Well, because what's what I said before, right, is like Ripley gets away from this. But she still lives in this terrible world. <laughs> like, <laughs> like her reality is still terrible. And that's something that's that's sort of the dark. That's why when we first started, I was like, Damon, why are these your favorite movies? Because like, because it's like it's such a dark place to live. You know what I mean? Like I what I just to bring it back to Pulp Fiction, like I always do, right? <laughs> Pulp Fiction is still set in sunny Southern California. And there's one of the yeah. things that's funny about it is, and literally, I mean, it's great about it, is that no matter how violent it gets, it's beautiful outside and you can still wear t-shirts. Like I know I'm being, I'm seeing, sounding a little flip, but it actually works for the movie yeah. because the culture of their surroundings is so laid back mm. that you feel like if you can just get away from this moment, things will be relaxed again. Like well as angry as Tarantino gets in as Jimmy, he never gets out of his robe, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like the reality of the aliens universe is a dark, dark reality yeah. yeah and i think it's one of my favorites because it is dark but it is nonetheless one of the most interesting worlds and when it comes down to it that's one of the things i, I care most about I, I i care about i mean people exposition exposition actually gets kind of knocked you know saying that films spend too much time exposition i want it to be action i actually kind of love exposition because that's when you set up the world that you're creating Me too. so i care a lot about the world that's created for a film and that's one of the reasons i love science fiction so much because you have so much more freedom uh and, all, and also, I just love the the plot devices in these two movies. Um, in fact, in fact, when I was, um, I can't remember if I, which of the Alien movies I'd seen at this point. Uh, but the first, actually, Phil, can I get a picture of this? Picture this, Damon. <laughs> is that it, the movies? 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not at the movies. I'm in New Orleans with Andy. <laughs> how old are How old are you? Uh, it's probably around eighth grade, maybe seventh. Um, you remember the New Orleans trip? Yeah. I, d- I do remember the New Orleans trip. <laughs> so, so it's, so it's <laughs> Andy and our friend Chris and me, and, and we're hanging out in New Orleans with at Chris's grandparents' place. Yeah. And uh, we're watching Alien 3, and I've never seen it. And Had you so, at this point seen 1 and 2? I'm not sure about it. I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I hadn't seen 1. I might have seen Aliens. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if, you know, we can spoil Alien Three or not, sure, but go ahead. How, how? Okay, the alien arrives. The, the alien gestates in a in a dog in Alien Three, which is something it's never done before. And so at the beginning, it sort of sets that up. You don't see the dog with the face hugger, or you don't see all that happen. But I, I turn to Andy and I say, Andy, can it gestate in a dog? And Andy looks at me and says, No. And and, and so I said, Oh, okay. And so we watch the movie, and then sure enough, it pops out of the dog. And I look at Andy and said, Andy. Uh, it just hated a dog just now. Andy, Andy, you lied to me. And Andy looks at me and says, "Well, I didn't want you asking questions." It's true. And w- 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 which which tells us two things. First, it, it is how devoted Andy is to an uninterrupted cinematic experience. Uh, we know this. We do. Second is how much how well Andy already knew me at that point to know that <laughs> I care so much about how the plot develops that he did, he didn't want me he didn't want any cross examination. <laughs> On the mechanisms behind Alien Three, <laughs> so that is how much I I'm interested in the world and in how the plot develops. Here, here I is, mean, you, you, yeah. you, 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 can, you can talk all you want about about you know really interesting characters and rich characters. I actually turns out don't care that much. I mean, I nice. want interesting characters so much of the next guy, but if you, you could have a transvestite Nazi Eskimo, and if his problem is that he likes a girl and she doesn't like him back, I'm like. Okay, here we go again. (laughs) You're right, you're right. And I think what I would say to that, by the way, is you said something about how people knock exposition. I think when we knock exposition, it's because it's really poorly done exposition. It's it's executed poorly. Well said, yeah. It's when someone's like, it's it's like whenever Dan Brown writes, really. I've not read read the man's work, I can't say. Someone gave me a a CD on tape of Angels and Demons, or a a book on CD, a CD on tape, hello. A book on... (laughs) (laughs) Let's all stop for CD on tape. Uh, I love it. Someone gave me a book on CD, and I was driving across the country by myself, which is a lonely endeavor. Indeed. And I had to stop listening to the book because it was so ridiculous. I have... I have two things to say. One, right. uh, a a uh, a response to that story that that Damon told. I would love to tell you that I did that because I already knew. In addition to all of those things, I also knew that that if you're going to cross-examine a movie, Alien Three is not the one you want to cross-examine. Okay. And that it's not that I was just a little jerk. I would like to tell you that. Yeah. My second response. Uh, my second thing I want to say is 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 uh, this. I dated a girl in New York City who her favorite book was The Da Vinci Code. And I was okay. like, no, 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 no. The, the, your favorite, like the best one Wait, you've ever read. Can I ask you something? Can I ask you something? She was like, yeah, I you, used The Da Vinci Code. You dated a girl or you went on a date with a girl? This is important for me. Dated. Okay. Dated. Well... You know what, Andy? We have a saying here back in Texas. Maybe you have it where you are, too. I hate you. Fool me. Fool me once. Shame on. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Won't get fooled again. Well, I mean, clearly that's the first thing I ask. I, I ask everyone. Like, I just go down the street asking, is The Da Vinci Code your favorite book? Um, let's uh, let's, let's hey, move on. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I just want to say, Damon, basically in, in Angels and Demons, here's how exposition works. So you mean to say, someone will go, what it looks like is that the assassin will be here on Thursday. Do you mean to say that the assassin will be here on Thursday? Yes, on Thursday, the assassin will show up. Like, that's actually what happens. And it happens so many times that I was like, and we're done. All actually, plot points are delivered in triplicate. Yes, yes. Which, actually, which Jesus did, but he did a much better job of it. That's not, that's not how it's done because Phil was far more subtle and nuanced than it actually is in the book. <laughs> Yo, oh, it's, it's terrible. Ter- but you know what? Who are we to disagree with eight kajillion copies of his book sold? Uh, so, 
Oh, the last thing I want to say about Alien, when she's in the escape shuttle and, and like you're watching the Nostromo like zoom by every time, I lean just a little bit, try to make yep. him go faster. Yep. Please go. Please go. <laughs> so, Aliens. Yes. Game over, man. Game, Game over, over, man. You know, I mean, I feel like we've spent, we've talked a lot about Alien and Aliens. It's true. Uh, it's true. And we've done a lot, but I'm Damon. I'm wondering if there's anything that you think we just, we haven't jumped into yet in terms of Aliens. Oh, um, I mean, cer- certainly we haven't talked about in detail how it transitions to an action movie, and I, can't, I couldn't think of another series of movies that did that, that jumped genres like that. But right. I, I will grant you, I did not think about it for all that long. No, uh, but you, I mean, it didn't jump, it, as you said, it, it, uh, it jumps genres, but I mean, in terms of... Uh, and you see the development. You see the development of the people. You see the development of the alien as well, though. I mean, I mean, the sure. alien. You learn more about this alien. And the alien queen she, invention is fantastic. And that's the yes. moment where she, like, that's the moment for me where where Sigourney Weaver's character, where Ripley turns, which is when she goes not when she goes down, oh, when she goes down and she goes to get the girl. But there's that moment when she's faced with the queen, and that moment where you realize it. But yeah. she does that thing where she just holds the flamethrower towards one of the eggs and looks at the queen. Yes. And it works. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, she starts to move back, and one of the eggs pops open, and she's like, all right, uh, yeah. we're done. You, 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 you have violated the social contract. Yes, you yes, what? Here. Right, right. The you line no must longer... be drawn. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, queen alien. You are no longer in the tree of trust. Right. With the little safety I nest. Love, I love the little eye roll she gives. It's, where it's just like, yeah. it's like oh, yeah. all right. I mean, I'm burning this. I'm burning this place to the ground. Right. You, you, you. This one's my on hand. you. <laughs> this one's. You know what? I some of this was our fault. I'll give it to you. Paul Reiser was was a mess. Right. Dirt this bag. one's on, <laughs> this this one's one's on, on you. you. Here's here is here is what here is what I'd say about that. I I don't I don't disagree with you, but. But what I love about that is it's not like a smooth process. Like right after that, the aliens start coming and she does kill them with the gun, right? But it's not like, da, 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 da. it's like, ah, da, 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 da. you know, right, she's like right. freaking out and she happens to hit them. And then, and then she's using a flamethrower and a grenade launcher, which I mean, horseshoes right. and hand grenades, right? You don't have to be, you, yeah. nothing yeah, she yeah. uses, yeah. You, need a, 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 you need a sniper's touch. Um, and then of course it's complete with and then and then she's like oh god the elevator oh god the elevator so it's not she isn't pure rambolina until right. she gets in the, until we discover that that she's back that the queen has hitched a ride and is back on right. the the the, yeah. the ship proper and she gets into but, that loader she's and, only why is she and why is she like that right damon why is she like that why is which one like the, why does she turn into rambo oh well it's maternal instinct yeah i and, and which, which side which comment is, about that? The when, when she walks to that room and, and and having when you know when she shoots the flames in the air to demonstrate the threat to the eggs, it's a pretty lucky break for Ripley that the queen cares about those eggs because usually a species that lays hundreds and thousands of eggs doesn't really care much about <laughs> right, a dozen of right. them. Right, that's it's fair. Like, that's a fair point. It's like okay, whatever, kill them. Right. Yeah, right. Do exactly. you see the eight thousand behind? I can make more yeah. of these. Yeah. Like I haven't named them. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the girl who plays Newt, Carrie Han, was never in another movie. Yeah. And she is wonderful. Yes. The relationship, she is not only good in the way that most child actors are not. She's never cutesy. She's cute. She's adorable. She has some funny lines. You know, she doesn't have any thoughts in her head because she's made of plastic. But right. like, but it, but it's it's real. It, and. More than that, the mark of a truly great actor is she makes the actors around her better. And as great as Sigourney Weaver is, she wasn't like like it, it, she deserved the actor. She she deserved the acting nomination yeah. because of her scenes with yeah. Carrie Henn. And, 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 and oh. by the way, and I want to take it to another level, another level of how awesome the producers of this movie were and how Jim Cam- James Cameron was. They they gave her second billing. Even though she'd never been in anything before and was not famous in any way, that is awesome. She's and I did second not billing know that. in the film. I, How cool I did is not that? Notice that. Yeah. yeah. I think I think another thing I think another thing that uh, that I love about the maternal instinct because because frankly, flat out, I mean, the action scenes were thrilling, the horror scenes were scary. I loved Aliens as much as I always do, but the thing that really stuck out for me this time was the maternal instinct, and I think I think it's I yeah. 
and much like so so on one on in in the first movie Ripley's counterpart is Veronica Cartwright. In this movie her her uh, her counterpart is Vasquez who is like yeah. so but but the process of the movie except for her scenes with Newt is her becoming more like Vasquez. Like she she mm. is in many ways defeminized by this movie, but the maternal instinct is so evident that it keeps her grounded and it keeps her real. I well, thought that I, was I would, fascinating. I, I would, the only thing I would argue is this is our understanding of defeminized, that she becomes closer. I think like it, w- what this movie does is it changes our understanding of what it means to be feminine. Like it, it, it says like to, to, a, to, to become, to embrace the violence for, ne- for those reasons, to embrace that aggressive behavior is not inherently masculine. This doesn't belong just to the. That's man. a fair point. Right. That's a fair and, point. And 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 I think that's a really fascinating point that the movie makes. Everything I just said, stick the word traditionally in front of every time I say Good. feminine. Got it. No, got, it right. got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and, and well, I think the other way, which is she's a counterpart to Vasquez, or Vasquez is a counterpart to Ripley, is that Ripley, either because of her character or by virtue of having been through the first movie, has a respect for the situation that they're up against, whereas Vasquez doesn't. So Vasquez is always. Headstrong, right? You, you, you know, you, she's not. She's certainly not cowardly like Bill Paxton is, but she's also overconfident in the total ab- absence of information. Um, and Ripley is Ripley's always the one saying, "Oh well, I hope it turns out that well, but let's have a backup plan here." Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's another way that she and, and Vasquez are, are sort of opposites. There's there's something I want to bring up about both movies, and it's it's another it's another comparison. Although this is this is where they diverge uh, rather than converge uh, with Die Hard. Die Hard as an action movie has one of the best uh, instances of showing you geography in in motion picture history, and I, I, I stand by that. It's it basically, you know, the scene where he's running around and, and he he like looks at the centerfold, the pinup girls, and then later he's like girls, you know. Right. He comes back. He sees him again. We right. know where he mm-hmm. is. Right. It's funny, but that's exa- but that's why he does it in terms of like building a movie. That's why he does it because you know where he is. It, it builds yeah. the geography. Right. In Alien and Aliens, you never know the geography. And instead of being confusing in a bad way, it's, a, it's confusing in a scary way, in a good way. Because when she's, especially at the end of Alien, she's running through like a fog-filled hallway. How far yeah. is it to, to the escape pod? You don't know. Right. Yeah. right. You know, she's down looking for Newt. You didn't see her go all the way down. So you don't know how far it is back to the elevator. You don't know how far it is from the elevator back up to the platform. You don't know. And for... Right. And for- Aliens, it ties right into the, the Vietnam references that James Cameron is trying to make. Well said. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if we, if we want to talk about that. Um, I, I think it's an interesting. We can talk. I mean, look, the, here's the thing: is I think we can talk about this movie for like four years. So I guess That's my true. only question would be: is do you want to talk about it? <laughs> oh, um, because we, we don't have to. What are the things? What is? What's left on your docket, Damon? Uh, well, I certainly have the the Vietnam thing, but I think some of those are we can do that pretty quickly. Some of those things are fairly obvious, right? You have a, a, a effectively American, technically technologically advanced force fighting sort of the native element that doesn't have technology, but it knows the environment better than you do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you have um, you have some sort of socio political entity that's putting the troops there in the first place. It's not really up to them. They just, n- none of them are, are really gung ho about this. They're all sort of reluctantly going into the situation. Just the grunts, right. yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah. In fact, the gung, and in fact, the gung ho that they portray is really just more a matter of like, that's their, and I'm not saying this to belittle them, that's what they, that they put that persona on themselves yeah. for the sake of getting through it. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and one thing I, 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 so I thought about those elements before. One thing I hadn't noticed and maybe this is just incidental. Yeah, I don't want to read too much into stuff, but there are little <laughs> there are, there are visual references. Things like uh, at the very end when basically they, they go up, they're up on that tower or on that platform, going into the into the drop ship, and that's the last group of humans that's leaving. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen that iconic photo of right. the fall of the, Saigon. Right. Where you have that helicopter on top of the building. Right. Yes. And that you know the, 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 the Viet Cong are coming. Like the tanks are on their way. Everyone get in this chopper. That's it. We're out. Power, and we're taking off, and we're never coming back. Yes. Right. You know, obviously, we, we didn't nuke Vietnam on the way out, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I didn't get that visual. I mean, if that is what they were trying to do, um, I was just thinking that you know, there's no there's no reason that had to be on a tower platform the way right. it was. That's yeah. right. That's well said. That's really interesting. I didn't so, notice that, but you're right. Um, yeah, that, that's about all I needed to say about 
the Vietnam elements, I think. Sure. Uh, one, one, one little just throwaway, it's, it's, it's a throwaway joke, but it's, it's when Bill Paxton, uh, when they're all in the, in the in operations and they're looking at the map and they're scrolling around and they're all gathered around that, that blueprint table and somebody walks up and Bill Paxton says, smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> I thought about, like, I wonder if anyone too much younger than we are will get will know what that's a reference oh, to. Oh, wow! Interesting. I, mean, I, about, I love how dated both of these movies are, that they're both set in the future, but their technology is terrible and everybody smokes. Yeah. I was and, like, and then, that's, interesting. Uh, right. Those are actually two of the things on my docket, is smoking. Right. Like, Alien, it's, it's everyone smokes, it's all full of smoke, it's like being on a smoking flight back when they had yeah. those. Yeah. Right? Aliens, you still have people smoking. Yeah. And, and you have smoking or non-smoking. Like, the smoking and or non-smoking the, and by the way, you had restaurant the, are eternal. And you, you know. had the illegal and you had the illegal alien joke. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's instantly dated. <laughs> yes. Just how far? I mean, we're we're like a hundred years ahead of the future, and this is still an issue. The border is still a problem. Yeah, we, we still have. And maybe it is. And maybe it is. But I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, I think a hundred years in the future, we're all trying to get into Mexico. Let's be honest. So at the rate things are going, not if global warming keeps happening, we're all gonna be we're, we're all gonna be at the other border trying to get into Canada. No, and the problem is Canada set themselves up as too nice to say no. That's true. So. We don't really uh, okay. We, okay, you're here, eh? I guess, eh? I don't know Did about you try this. To help out today? I hear right. Nudovic's nice. Um, <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You never heard uh, that. And, and and you brought up the other one, uh, which is technology, uh, which is really interesting, especially the the computer. Uh, how they interact with computers. So in the first one, the computer mother is a room that you walk into because we're not too far from the era where computers took up entire rooms. Yes. Right. Um, and you have those, you know, it's surrounded by blinking lights like, oh, well, this is all. I was like, I can't possibly has. think of the function for all these lights. Can I tell you my yeah. favorite part of that? Part of the, my favorite part of the process going into mother is when they pull out the data card and pushing it in pops open the little door that they then stick their <laughs> fingers in. I was like, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Couldn't they just uh, use their imagination and assume there would be things you could wave your hand over and stuff like that? Really? Right. Well, so, so that's that's exactly what I, what I thought we might talk about is that the it, you know it seems like the amount of technology that's imaginable is scales with the year in which the the film is made. So you have you know Alien, where the computer is a room you walk into, and and it's advanced insofar as it can understand your questions that you type in. You can't talk to it. But you, you can type in your questions, and it can hopefully come up with a helpful answer. It happens not to, but you have to assume. That, <laughs> if that, that it never did, capable. they wouldn't have it. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so, and then in Aliens, you have you know more sophisticated displays and things like that. But um, you know, and then you go years later to something like Minority Report, where at the time you have Tom Cruise bringing things up on the screen, he moves them with his hands, he has sort of gesture-driven visualization. Right. Right. And now, we, now we've got that. Um, and of course, now that we have CGI in movies, we ha we can Ooh. implement all sorts of things. So that's one of the things I was curious about: was whether it's really an implementation issue or whether it's an issue of imagination when it comes to I, technology in movies. I kind of feel like it's an imagination issue only because the stuff that, for instance, they show in Minority Report or Iron Man, we still can't do those things in real life. Right. But you've also got you've also got Star Trek guys, which which predates Alien and and presupposed a wildly more advanced. Honestly, the way I took it was this. Um, the, the fact is these, uh, like this company, it's a mining company. I mean, Wayland yutani does everything, but right. these are miners. Yeah. The company is not wasting their best stuff. That's a good idea. That's on, a good point. On, on miners. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, that, that. That's fair. I, but I think it's also, you know, Star Trek, for example, the technology, you know, what, what the ship could do or what the people could do was advanced. But the way yep. they interacted with it wasn't, and so Alien, That's fair. the computer is, you know, is obviously advanced in some sense. But you're still typing at a keyboard. That's the part that they didn't imagine would be beyond what they right. had at the time. Which is like Star Trek, you know, you've got uh, it's like you know, or, or, or Sulu, you know, they've got sliders that they move up and down, and that's how they make the ship go. That's uh, fair. They can't just say, okay, Enterprise, ten degrees left, hit it. <laughs> right. Um, you're right. So really how they interact with technology is one of the interesting things about these movies. Sure. Uh, well, listen, I think, I, I, as, as Phil said, we, we, could, we could talk about this movie for... Forever. Forever. Or these movies forever. Uh, and Damon, this was wonderful. And we will clearly... We will cl 
pick another movie, dude, because we're going to have you on again. Yeah, we want to have you back on, and I want to talk to you more in terms of just in terms of the psychology. We might just have you on and talk about the psychology of different characters and like what they're how how disastrous or how amazing. I'd love. I think. How about this? Here's what I'd like. Here's my assignment for you, I, I, which you can choose to ignore completely. But I would love <laughs> if there are characters whose decisions that they make as characters, specific characters in movies, have always intrigued you both for their admirable qualities and maybe ones where you're just like, no. Or, or ones that you're like, like this movie where you're like, well, bad decision, but you were using the best efforts. Like, I'd love to talk to you about character decision making in movies. I think sure. that'd be a really fun thing to have you on for if there are movies that you've watched and thought about. And if this is your field, I have to believe that you've thought about this stuff. A little bit. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Whenever someone like Damon says something like a little bit, what he means is, I obsess over this. Or he means I've never done it, and now I have to go back and prep like I've obsessed over it. One of the two. True. Uh, So, uh, folks, uh, this will bring us to the end of this segment. Uh, Phil and I uh, are going to continue on with with some mailbag questions in a moment. But for now, Damon, thank you so much. This is fantastic. Uh, Damon Tomlin, everybody. Yes. It's a Uh, joy and an honor to have you on the show, Damon, and we look forward to having you again. I look forward to it, too. All right. So that was uh, creme de la creme. I like that. I think that was good. Yeah, we're going to do it more. Totally. Damon, And if he's, he's salt of the earth. I love that guy. Salt of the earth. He's a, he's a solid guy. I'm, I'm glad to meet uh, You have introduced me to some good, some good people. I, I try. On this, on this podcast. And just to, just to reiterate, he's a brain scientist. Yeah. I mean, let's be clear. You haven't introduced me to as good of people as I've introduced you to, but that's okay. That's okay. Really? That's okay. Really? Yeah. I'm yeah, just saying... Answer. I'm just saying, if we went Sharks versus Jets here, I think we could take you. I'm just saying that. Whatever it takes to make you feel that way. I, I think the truth is what it takes okay. to make me feel that way. Okay. And without further ado... I'd like to point out that I'm the only one who brought a professional screenwriter onto our show. And an English teacher uh, for, for Hamlet, whose name is Dallas. Come on! It's his name! i got to be honest with you. i got to be honest with you. I know another guy named Dallas. Your Dallas is my favorite Dallas. But I could have hated him, and he still would have been my favorite Dallas. To say nothing of the fact that the city is... Sorry, people who live in Dallas that I love. Eh. Okay. I don't care about, I don't care about the city. Yeah. The man is all I need. That, I, am, I am extremely happy for you. <laughs> yep. And away we go, dipping into the mailbag. From good friend of the podcast, Andrew. Ugh. Hi, Andrew. Here's the problem. Andrew lives oh. in Dallas. Sorry. <laughs> Andrew. No, really. No, really. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> he said that, not me. But I thought it. Yep. Uh, from Andrew. Who is the most annoying character in a movie that you love? Huh. Like a tough question. question. It's, it's a tough it is question. a tough question. It's because... a tough question because if you love something, by virtue of the fact, it's probably not going to be terrible I... or have even terrible aspects. It's true. I, I went through my entire DVD list, and as you know, it is not a short list. And I, 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 it was, it was a struggle. I think I found a couple people, but it was a struggle. I'd love to hear yours, but I have one that's a very quick answer. Please hit me. Mike Myers in Inglorious Bastards. Nice. It is the one blemish on an otherwise, in my opinion, perfect film with perfect casting. Um, I admire the chutzpah of Quentin Tarantino casting Mike Myers, putting him in that makeup and making him play it straight as a British guy mm-hmm. doesn't matter. I know who's there. I know who's nice. under the makeup. Okay. Mike Myers who used to be somebody I looked forward to greatly, no longer is. And uh, then he made, I think then he and made awesome, just, power seven, awesome Power 17 and The Love Guru. Yeah, I just Ugh. I'm it just, I just it really really rubbed me the wrong way. Sure, that's totally And I'm so glad, and the only reason that I'm not, like, actually mad about it, and it doesn't ruin Inglorious Bastards for me, is it really only lasts five minutes. True. So. Fair. So that's that. That's that. What's yours? Uh, So this is an actor that I don't always love, but this is the, this is the, I, sometimes I find him okay. (laughs) That's, that's as much as I'm willing to give him. I, I'm not entirely sure how to say his name. Joe Lotrulio? Oh, I love Joe Latrulio. Oh, he's, it, from, he's from the state. That's fine. The, the the specific role, yeah, is is the the guy who hits Jonah Hill with his car in Superbad. He's just it just it, it like his part goes on too long. Um, before he's fine once he gets to the party because there's a lot of other stuff going on, but it just it, he just annoys the crap out of me. He just does. 
Uh, interesting. Gonna have to uh, gonna have to agree to disagree with you there. But go ahead. Okay. Yeah. For example, what I find interesting is he doesn't bug me, and I love you, man. And he is far more quote unquote annoying in that movie, but he doesn't bug me. But I think actually my answer for this, my, my main answer, is Barbara in Night of the Living Dead. Oh gosh. This yeah. Is, this is and 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 frankly, the fact that she's annoying is kind of revolutionary because she is unquestionably the heroine of the movie, and yet yeah. she gets traumatized at the beginning of the movie and is basically a quivering hot mess for the rest of the film. Just She's a useless hunk of person. Totally useless. She is functionally catatonic if she's not shrieking. It's it's unbelievable. It's effective, but she annoys the crap out of me. Yeah. Fair? Very fair. It yeah. almost makes up for your previous answer where I think I'm more offended that you didn't even know who Joe Latrulio was. I, I know that's who he is. I just hard. didn't know how to say his name. He's from the state, which is... Uh, okay. <laughs> that... I, you know I'm not as familiar with the state as you are. I am, I to be honest, barely familiar with the state. So, it's That's unsurprising. Clear. It's unsur- clear. Okay. It's unsurprising that it's not a get-out-of-jail free card for me. And even if it were, it's been quite some time. And other people who are on the state have done things that I have very much enjoyed. Is all I'm saying. Next question. You are the worst person in the world. From friend of the podcast, Anthony. Hello, Anthony. So this weekend, my fiancé met my grandmother for the first time, and my grandmother insisted on showing her all the movies I made with her ancient video camera when I was a kid. Nice. Eight, eight to ten. I love yes. this already. I made several. A military action flick, a sci-fi, and a mystery horror. Anyway, getting to the point. Honestly, Anthony, if that's the story, you take all the time you want getting to the point. That was amazing. What was each of your first attempts at creating something, even if you never actually commandeered a camera to film it? What do you think your inspiration was? How did it turn out? Please. You want me to go first? I do. Okay. Uh, I got a video camera and I made videos with my friends. I directed and wrote commercials and skits, fake commercials. My very first fake commercial was based on a, an injury lawyer named, there's a guy named Larry Parker. Okay. In California, okay. that was famous in Southern California. If you grew up in Southern California in the 80s, you know who Larry Parker is. Sure. And it always finished with Larry, I'll fight for you. And it always grew up with, it always ended with this one guy who goes, Larry Parker got me $2.1 million. All always right. ended with that guy's testimony. Sure. sure. And so we did a take on that. That was, I consider it, I, I remember it almost as say, we made a right guard commercial. Um, okay. Where where there's a, a firing squad and the guy's about to get killed and the the guy lifts up his <laughs> arm to say aim and everybody passes out from how bad he smells. Um, awesome. And uh, um, I made uh, a fake talk show uh, <laughs> where I was uh, I was it was an incredibly incredibly homophobic fake talk show that I did. I was nice. uh, twelve. Nice. No, I wasn't twelve. I was like I mean I was probably like ten. I was probably like ten or eleven. I was twenty seven. And I did a take on set. I did it. Yeah. I mean, it was. I did a gay talk show host that I. And so the whole joke was just that I was just flaming gay. That was. Oh, the joke. I didn't do anything that. It wasn't anything that was like. Uh, it wasn't anything that was like mean spirited or or. It was just basically me doing the gay guy from Airplane. That's all sure, it really was. Sure. And I, but growing up, growing up and being. <laughs> Growing, uh, it's funny now that I think now, you know, like now that I know my dad was gay, I wonder what it was like for him to watch me make. Uh, that, that is exactly what was in my head. I would, I, and, and for I, what it was like for him to have to keep his mouth—I mean, for him to keep his mouth shut, being right. in the closet and all—I right. wonder if that just freaked him out, or if he was like, "Ugh," or if he thought it was funny and was like, "That's my kid." <laughs> I did a football bloopers video. We did a video for Band Aids where a dog attacked me. Um, it, we did a lot of videos, and they were a blast. Um, and then I, I still have the video cassette, but I think it was ruined because it was in a basement for a really long time and it looks all moldy. I don't know if it can be oh, fixed, sure. but all right. I kind of don't care. I remember them all really beautifully. And awesome. every time we had bigger groups of people over, um, we'd have big like family parties and there would be like five, six, seven kids my age. I would just commandeer them and be like, we're making a movie awesome. or a video. And we would just make videos for the rest of that time and then show them to the people at the end of the night. Awesome. Yeah. That's my story. And that's what happened. Okay. Uh, mine's much shorter. Uh, here's the deal. Do you guys remember the video game, and it became a video game series, Ninja Gaiden? Oh, yeah! Awesome, right? 
he'd do these flips and then he would flip. Yes. Yes. He would like you could control his jumping mid jump. Yes. Oh, you could do that with a lot of people, but but he could like stick to walls. It was awesome. In, in it was it was awesome. I loved that game. Um, some friends of mine in sixth grade decided to make a Ninja Gaiden movie. Nice. And it, it, we we I'm glad you put that caveat in there, Anthony, because we never got to the actual shooting stage, which is good because. I mean, how are we even going to make the costumes for a freaking Ninja Gaiden movie? I mean, come on. But it fell to me to write the script. Nice. And I wrote the script. And because I was in sixth grade and I wanted people to speak with certain dialects. And when I say dialects, I mean like the good guy dialect and the bad guy dialect. I wrote, I remember this very distinctly. I wrote all the bad guy d- dialogue like phonetically like and like mean asian stereotype no 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 no, 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 okay. no it wasn't it, i i want to be very clear about this it wasn't like it was like uh the 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 main the main character's name is the the ninja is ryu hayabusa i believe okay and, and so it was like ryu ha, 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 ha. like it was just like evil person right 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 right, right. but but uh but yeah i was i was like Prepare to meet your doom. And so it was like, I would spell doom like D-O-M-M-M-M-M. Yes. <gasps> Fantastic. I love this. Sadly. Uh, what? Sadly. Uh, didn't make it to Sundance, the Oscars. You didn't make it to the Oscars that year? Sundance did not accept our... Uh, uh, I, let me put it this way. The script didn't make it onto the blacklist. Uh, c'est la vie. Um, yeah. So, so those are those are our mailbag questions. Uh, one last thing, and uh, and he deserves a lot more than this, but we don't have a lot of time. Mm. Uh, we uh, we lost we lost somebody big again, folks. We're shooting this on Tuesday, but we lost somebody big earlier this week. For you guys watching this when we release it, there you go. That's the right way to say. Uh, it. We lost somebody big this week. Uh, Elmore Leonard. Yep. Um, a a a novelist uh, with very few peers. He's just wonderful. Uh, and m- much of his much of his work was, uh, with varying degrees of success, uh, adapted for various size screens. The the biggest hit, almost certainly, is is Get Shorty. Yep. Um, but I but I, flat out, no questions asked. My favorite of his adaptations is the television show Justified. Yep. Um, it, it's he is he is a it, he is a giant. He is a giant. And he also write the, he also wrote the book LA Confidential. He did. He, oh, he did. And so, yeah. he wrote he wrote a book, Rum Punch, which became Jackie Brown. Yes. Um, yeah, Elmore Leonard. I don't know any of his books. I've never read one of his books. I've only seen things that are adapted to it. Um, so yeah, and Jackie Brown is one of my favorite things in the world. I like Justified a whole lot. I wonder how much of it is of him. But either way, me too. I mean, he's, me too. He's Elmore Leonard, and uh, and is one of those guys that uh, um, I was like. Oh, we lost him already? And then I looked and he was like 87 years old. It's, it's true. Like, oh! It's true. Or 89. He was 89. I was like, oh. And you, that's and you old. I mean, it's it's ridiculous you can, because. You're allowed to, yeah, that's when you. Right, can, no, totally. It's not, it's not unexpected. It's not tragic anymore. It's not no, tragic. But it, 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 is, it is a loss. It is a loss. Yeah, so, agreed, agreed, agreed. So. And he was very, and he was, it seemed, uh, he was active all the way up to the end. That's true. That's true. Which is awesome. Uh, yeah, he suffered a, he suffered a stroke a couple weeks ago and never really recovered. Right. Um, so with that somber note, uh, rest in peace, Elmore Leonard. Um, watch watch a movie based on an Elmore Leonard novel t- this right. week, or or, or or start Justified. Just start oh, was, it. You'll love it. I was going to suggest reading a book, but never mind. Come on, what what podcast are you on, man? I'm sorry. Well, you just talked about TV. I, I know. At least there's a screen. I'm close. Fair point. Or Fair read point. it on a Kindle. Okay, <laughs> folks. Uh, hey, man. Yeah. Just have a good weekend. Hey, you too. And yeah. folks out in uh, Second Breakfast Nation, you guys have a good weekend too. We're Second Breakfast. I'm Andy Roth, and that's Phil Duvall. Bye-bye. Bye now. The most important meal of the day, Second Breakfast.